Hello, everybody. Welcome back to How Come. Today, we're talking about fear-based dating, toxic relationships, narcissism, and where it all stems from with Dr. Natalie Jones. And here with me is my fantastic little Robin Kennedy. Hello. Hello. This is our second to last episode of the year. I already edited an episode with me and Ben. Just like a tiny catch up with us. We didn't really do like a come grats or anything. Our come grats is just being reunited. But um, <laughs> this is an actual come grats that I had. Blows my mind that it happened. It still blows my mind. Yeah. I can't wait to hear this fucking story. It's mad. But before we do, I just want to thank all of you companions for being here this season. We love you so much. And thanks to Dipsy for supporting How Come. Dipsy is an audio app full of short, sexy stories. If you're looking to heat things up, there's a story waiting for you. Get an extended 30-day free trial when you go to dipsystories.com slash howcome. Okay, so we've kind of already talked about this a little bit before. I've done it in the past, but never this crazily. Like, it's been like... Really? I didn't know that you had done it in the past. To, like, it definitely wasn't... Uh, like complete in the past it was just like I was on the right track but then I was like gone but this time right. okay wait before we get into this I know that I have just set it all up but before we get into this um, last episode with Sarah Rose we got a few messages after it and one of them um, I just wanted to read on the pod because I thought it was a really good and valid message This companion said, hey, how come team? I just finished listening to the tantric episode. I know things like meditation and yoga and tantric sex are so normalized these days that a lot of people forget that they're appropriated from Hinduism. But I feel kind of uncomfortable listening to this white woman talk about tantra through such a limited lens. Tantra is about so much more than sex for Hindus, just like yoga is about more than just exercise and relaxation. It's a way for us to connect our souls with each other as humans and with Bhagwan, which is God. I know Sarah said that she went to India, but at the end of the day, she's a white woman profiting off of a culture that isn't hers, and all the books she mentioned were by white women. There are tons of POC Hindus working to reclaim our culture who would be much more accurate and appropriate source. Um, And then she was like, I hope I don't sound rude or judgmental. Just wanted to bring this up because appropriation is so normalized, but this is just not okay. I love the pod so much. It's created um, so much space. Uh, for companions to learn and grow and, uh, you know, like super nice. And she was like, also, I'm Hindu, LOL, should have clarified. And like, yes, like I I, I agree. We agree. Yeah. I think um, I kind of tried to, in the beginning of the episode, be like, just so you know, there's a lot of other forms. Um, But beyond that, there's a lot of other people to learn from. And we are working on it already we are setting up um another episode on tantra with henika patel um so she's supposed to come on in january and we're really excited to talk to her and yeah i'm just excited to have another episode about it because i feel like i didn't come away from that one like with too much of an understanding and we could always get more of an understanding yeah i feel like we kind of only really scratched the surface with that episode Mm -hmm. especially since it wasn't from like a traditional proper lens it was kind of you know like I felt like if I read an article I could probably talk to it the same degree right yeah as that episode yeah I think it'll I'm really excited to have Henneke on but it was interesting I asked a bunch of sex educators I was like yeah do you know any people who you could refer about Tantra and most of them pitched white people initially and I was like hmm like maybe it really has like been appropriated to the point that like we can't find anyone, but then eventually like we found people and there's a lot of people doing a lot of work. So yeah. definitely check out Henika if um, you want to right now. I'm just like loving her Instagram already and stay tuned for an episode. She has online events as well. So this congratulations, like I don't want to say that this is tantric in any way, but it's like, It's definitely... Okay, it definitely felt like some form of meditation. Yeah. Okay, so Rob, first of all, congratulations, just because I know what happened. I've never shared a sexual experience on the podcast. Have you not? Like, no, I've never. I've, like, put in my two cents on the episode, but I've never been like, hey, whoa, this is my... Congrats, uh, you're making your sexual debut on the podcast. Oh, isn't it great? It's really great. 
It really is. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Congrats. Tell us about this congrats. Okay. Yeah. So I'll start at the beginning. Probably last week I had six. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. Um, and it was like really late. It was like, well, like four o'clock in the morning kind of vibes. Mm -hmm. um, and then the whole of the next day I was like at work and I was like thinking about it and like doing shit. And I was like, all I could think about was like the night before. And I was like, okay, when I get home from work, I'm going to go outside. I'm going to have a little smoke. I'm going to come back in and I'm going to just have a wank because mm -hmm. I had planned my day. So I put my toys on charge in the morning because charge your toys. Charge your toys. Um, and yeah, I just spent the whole day like, you know, in my head, in the vibes, reliving the night before. Um, mm -hmm. And then I, I went out, I had a smoke, came back in and I was just like, I closed my eyes. I was like lying on my bed with my like hands above my head. Mm -hmm. And I was just like trying to get in the zone. Like I was replaying what had happened the night before. And I was like thinking about it. And I was like, okay, this is cool. Like Any back in music the music or no? No, 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 no. Just Literally high. nothing. Like okay. I had headphones in because mm -hmm. I was going to like connect to my TV in, in the end. But I no music, no nothing. Mm -hmm. um, and I was just like rethinking it. And I was like starting at the beginning um, of the night. And like all of a sudden, like I could feel what had happened the night before happening again. Like while An I was just lying in my bed, brewing. nothing there. Yeah, but like it was like you know um, when you're having sex with someone, and you can like when you're just like making out in the beginning, and you can like feel it was a it was a penis haver that I was mm -hmm. having sex with, mm -hmm. and you can like feel them like getting hard like on your leg maybe or whatever. Like yeah. I was thinking about that, and I was like I could feel it on my leg. Interesting, like, legit phantom um, boner. And then it was weird. It was crazy. And so then I felt like I had like astral projected out of my body. Mm -hmm. And I was like a director, just like chilling on the side, being like, okay, like put this scene in from this experience and this scene from this one, like cutting it all mm. together. And I was like making a movie, but I could like feel everything. Whoa. So it was crazy. So everything was like black because my eyes were closed, but I could mm. like visualize the internal structure that I as a Volvo owner have. And mm -hmm. that was all I could see. And anytime I was like, okay, you know, I can feel his dick on my leg, I could like see the sensation light up where I could Ooh. feel it on what I was visualizing, but That's I like so couldn't cool. see anything else. Yeah. And so like I was, I was definitely like getting distracted, ADHD brain. I was like, what if my mom just walks down the passage right now? Like she could easily just come into my room and I'm just, mm -hmm. I look like I'm possessed. Yeah. Um, and I was like, that's fine. Back in the moment. And I just kept like, you know, in and meditation. And just to remind everybody, like, nothing's happening with your own hands. No, my hands are here. My toy is still on charge. Hands are above the head. Hands is like legit above the head. Mm -hmm. um, I was in the middle of sending a text. I just had like put my phone down and mm -hmm. I was, didn't even finish the text. I got like way sidetracked. Mm -hmm. um, but it felt like meditation because, you know, when you're like trying to focus on your breathing or whatever and you get the thoughts and you're like, okay, cool. I'm going to note that thought, move mm -hmm. on, refocus myself. Mm -hmm. So it was very like that. Like I would get distracted and be like, did I just hear Ruby? No, I didn't. Okay, cool. Back in it. Mm -hmm. um, and I was just like, focusing on my breathing like I would meditating um yeah and all of a sudden I just like started like getting really into it like I started like moving my hips and like replaying everything Ooh. and I was like in like sleep paralysis almost you know when your body's like heavy and you can't move but you're like awake and you're mm -hmm. there but you're not and mm -hmm. it was like that but I was like stuck in an orgasm that's unreal. um and it just like For I felt long? it building I'll get there, my girl. Okay. I felt it building. Um, and I was like, just, I couldn't, even if I thought of something else, I couldn't stop like feeling the sensations. Um, and it just like kept building and building. And I swear it was definitely the whole experience itself was like 15 minutes. <sighs> um, and from probably, I would say it would have been like the five minute mark. I started like coming. Oh my God. Like it had just from me thinking about it, I started coming and I couldn't stop. Like I was like stuck in it and it was just like rolling. Oh I my felt God. like it was like sleep paralysis, but not a demon. It was just comes. And I couldn't, I couldn't, no matter what I tried, like I couldn't open my eyes. I couldn't leave this. I was stuck. I felt like I was in like a floating frisbee of outer space, just stuck in this. Like one of those rolling. float tanks, but have come. Yeah, but have come. And it just like kept going. It was the most intense thing. I ended up squirting, so... 
Wow. But it was like. Holy shit. For sure, the best orgasm of my whole entire life. And I didn't like even you need hands, need anything. And it just, the brain is powerful, man. Powerful. And you had some really great sex that you could like pull from too. That, yeah. But I know I was pulling from like all of my like sexual experiences. So I was like, oh, remember when this yeah, person did yeah, this? Yeah, 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 yeah. did that. I'm going to chuck that in. Creating that like a perfect scene. little like build Yeah, like that's why I, scenario. I felt like, <laughs> yeah, you know, you know it. Um, like that's why I felt like a director because I felt like I could like be out of it and thinking like, okay, mm -hmm. what did I like from this one? But I was still feeling what was going on in those thoughts. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, cool. Cut that scene in. Add it. it was like the best of so all sick. the world. Okay. Well, congrats. Was, but, and, and also whew. when you were talking about meditating, did, have you started using that meditating app? Just the free version because I'm stingy. The 10% better though? Yeah. Yeah, I was like, are you it using the same thing? Like you're using, you're tr using the same terminology. Um, well, that like cuz I I used to use Headspace. Shout okay, out okay. Charlotte for getting me into that like 4 years ago. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, shout out to Charlotte. She also um like suggested a narcissism book for you to read. Yes. That we yeah. mentioned She's later in this episode. Wrecks. Yeah, Charlotte's got good Rex. She does. But yeah, no, so I was just like fully in the meditation zone mm -hmm. unstoppable couldn't unreal but I was aware like I knew I knew I like kept being so worried that mum was going to come in and it looked like I was fully possessed because I was like my body was moving I couldn't stop it my hands were above my head but like the rest of me had like a mind of its own mm -hmm. so if anyone walked in it would look like there was like a demon like pulling me up but I mm. was like not there I was present but I wasn't but I was there but I, I felt oh, it was Bro, I, I can't. That's very I just in line like, with like orgasms thing. being like magical witch power. Like Legit. you would definitely get burned at the stake after that one back in the day. Oh, for sure. For sure. But then I was like, well, at least I saved the battery on my toys. Didn't even need those batteries. Yeah, you didn't even need them. Yeah. Waste of power charging them all day. Manifestor baiting. Yeah. No it was hands. fucking insane. I was like exhausted afterwards. I needed like 15 minutes and a power aid just to like I can't even imagine get my life back on track yeah and then I did it again after that like another time that night because I was like what? can I do it again what could do it again it Bro. feels so crazy I cannot recommend it enough like hearing about it and also just like talking about it because I like we really don't talk about your stuff no. and I feel like I'm talking to like my like little brother slash son slash like like I'm like oh my god I finally understand why parents are like a little uncomfortable talking about this with their children <laughs> like I'm so happy for you but I'm also like should I know about this <laughs> is this for my ears yeah yes no you can you can know this no but dude I 10 out of 10 would recommend like yeah. I know it's not necessarily easy for everyone but no, some people though, are just like, trying to come like in general little not but i mean the, i feel like the way that this worked being able to pull from things because it was also like i could i was putting in like movie characters that i was like mm, mm. they're hot i'm gonna chuck them in this one mm -hmm. or i remember when they had this scene in their movie let me do that scene but me yeah and i was just like <sighs> mind blown so it cool was, and you don't even have to 100 percent be thinking about like coming the whole time like I was for sure distracted but the premise of everything was like I was bringing it back to like I was just trying to get in the mood to like yeah. grab my toy it wasn't yeah even, yeah yeah it wasn't even like this is what I'm doing it was I was just trying to you know mm -hmm. that's what they always say about the going. journey though is like try not to like focus on the end just try to focus on the thing itself and like look what happened on the way yeah exactly and like I for sure was it was like one point, I don't even know what I was thinking about, but I kind of started like losing the feeling and I was like, oh mm -hmm. shit, no, okay, bring it back, bring it back. Let me like start at the beginning. I didn't even make it through the whole like sexual experience from the night before. Mm -hmm. I only got through like the first act and I was like, damn, mm -hmm. this is amazing. Which is why the second time I did it, I was like, okay, let me get to the part where I actually like came during the sex. Let me like yeah. try that part and my thoughts. Mad. Like, you don't even need meditation apps or whatever. If you want to, like, be mindful, just 
be, be mindful. Appreciate mm. yourself. Yeah, but sometimes you need those tra- training wheels. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. For sure. But I mean, sometimes you think you're going to grab a toy and it just happens. For sure. It was fucking insane. Yeah, this I was... I couldn't leave. This is not how I expected <laughs> to wind down the season. <laughs> What did you want? Like, what kind of congrats did you want? No, I mean, this is everything we could have wanted. A hands-free congrats. Yeah. Like, what are you fucking kidding me? But that's why there won't be one next episode because we can't top this. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, I, I honestly, I don't think I've ever experienced anything like it. Like the, mm-hmm. oh my God, Siri, fuck off. Like euphoria, the, the fact that it was like, I was stuck. Like I was aware that I was like dreaming. Mm-hmm. I was aware of everything that was going on and I was like aware of where I was and everything, but I just couldn't open my eyes to leave it. Like it was like, it felt like what I imagined it would be like if someone else was like using a toy on you. So it's like out of your control what happens. Yeah. You know, like if you're like tied to a bed and they're like, I was going to say, it sounds this. like, like it you're like tied like to a bed. The power wasn't, yeah, like the, I didn't, I wasn't in control. Like it was like a different me that was making me come so fun it was amazing it's like when you sit on your hand and it's numb and then jack off with the numb hand and it feels like a stranger would recommend would do you have any other sex goals going into 2022 (sighs) sex goals well i mean i'm i don't know i'm just excited to be um having different experiences around the world yeah many different people yeah, we're going to, Robin's going to come here and we're either going to have a lot of shows or we're going to vlog a ton. Um, next episode, you will hear me and Rob and Ben kind of like wavering on whether we're going to do the shows or not because like we recorded it a few weeks ago and we still weren't sure. But now it looks like, you know, if you're vaxxed and you're boosted and you feel comfortable, we're going to do stuff and you can be there or you cannot, but we're pumped to do our show at caveat definitely january 27th and it is the theme is international sex which robin is pumped about and uh it's also her birthday show for her 21st birthday and we are doing a live show but it's also going to be a live ticket streaming link so if you guys are around the world you can still join us and it'll be a real fun time right robbie yes finally it's gonna be so good links below um, for 2022, I am excited to just get get my groove back. We'll talk about that more in the next episode with Ben. Um, and uh, just, yeah, I guess travel more and meet more of you people and, and grow this podcast more and get more people to have their own congrats and get the whole world feeling good. There was something actually that our companion said about tantra being a way for us to connect our souls with each other as humans and that's something that i've been thinking about is i'm like you know what benefits one of us benefits all of us like we really are like a connected fabric and all ships rise together and all ships come together and yeah i just want to connect more and meet more of you and i'm excited and again there is another episode after this one but this one i'm really excited about um we were initially going to put it out uh, before the holidays because it was like about dealing with toxic families and narcissism in families and how to heal from unhealthy relationships. But I didn't want to send people in with bad vibes because I know not everybody has problematic families. But this episode is for people who do or problematic relationships. It could even be a job relationship that's toxic. Um, so we're going to hear about all about that with Dr. Natalie Jones, who... I love. Um, She received her master's in clinical counseling psychology from the Chicago School of Professional Psychology. And she has her doctorate in clinical psychology. And she's written books for the Minds Journal, Peskin Law Firm, Therapy for Black Girls, and Medium. Uh, She's also got a podcast called A Date with Darkness, which specializes in providing education and tips, healing from narcissistic abuse in relationships. And you guys are just going to love her. How come? How come? How come I can't achieve? How come I can't achieve? I'm rolling up my sleeves. I'm rolling up my sleeves. Oh baby, I believe these guests can help. Cause
Cause I can do it by myself I wanna jizz a little bit of trigger warning for this episode. We're talking about um, some narcissistic qualities, some bad family behaviors, some abuse. And um, if any of that is sensitive to you, just beware. Um, but we are hoping to have a really great learning time with Dr. Natalie Jones. And I hope you really liked Robin's congrats. Uh, we got cut off because a little tech new, but I'll ask her more questions about it if you want to know about it. But I was thinking to myself, if you guys wanted to get more mindful and get more in the mood and maybe try to achieve your own hands free, check out Dipsy. Um, holidays aren't just for hanging out with the family. They're also about hanging out with yourself and it's cold when it's chilly, I like to bring the warmth into the bedroom with Dipsy. So if you're looking to heat things up, there's a story waiting for you. Maybe you want to get horny hands free. Yeah. Uh, Tis the season to seek out pleasure in every area of your life. So from how to start your mornings to how you wind down at night and everything in between, you deserve to enjoy it all. Dipsy Stories is an app full of sexy audio stories. And now they even have new written stories. Close your eyes and let yourself get lost in a world where only good things happen and pleasure is your only priority. Enjoy your fantasies in a safe, shame-free way. They also have wellness sessions to help you wind down and explore and sleep sessions to help you drift off. I love Dipsy. It's so fun. Have I achieved what Robin has? Not yet, but I have achieved so much more in my fantasy and in my mind. And Dipsy really helps unlock and feel easy and good and that group sex category, you guys. So for companions, Dipsy is offering an extended 30-day free trial when you go to dipsystories.com slash how come. That is 30 days of full access for free when you go to D-I-P-S-E-A stories.com slash how come. Dipsystories.com slash how come. You'll love it. All right. And you're also going to love Dr. Natalie Jones. Thank you so much for being here and welcome Dr. Natalie. Thank you for having me here. I'm excited to be here too. So many questions to ask you. We're going to talk about toxic relationships, toxic families, narcissism, how to figure out if someone's a narcissist. Mm -hmm. um, but I want to start with fear-based dating because it's something that I kind of have mm -hmm. alluded to in other episodes, especially the one with um, queer sex therapy. And the first place that I saw the term fear-based dating was on your Instagram. There was mm -hmm. amazing infographic. And I think let's just break it down for anybody um, who might be fear-based dating now um, or maybe has in the past. And then we'll talk about why that happens. Yes. So fear-based dating is fearing that no one will want you as you are and that you'll have to settle for being alone. Mm -hmm. um, settling for crumbs of a relationship, taking someone back after multiple betrayals, Mm -hmm. investing all of your time and energy into one person who is unavailable for you, mm -hmm. constantly wondering what the other person is up to and why they haven't called, um, not expressing your thoughts, feelings, or needs, feeling like the dating world is trash, giving up easily on dating and wanting to settle into a committed relationship quickly without knowing a person. Mm -hmm. And that one, I was like, oh my God, because I feel like that that's a lot of the dating that I was doing is I would just be like, oh my, somebody date me, please. Like, I don't even care who, just like <laughs> say I'm yours, claim me. And that happens quite a bit. And I'm yeah. not laughing at you, but it, it, you know, the way you say it, it's like, yes, that's how people are. It becomes a, a desperation. And it's a lot of times vacillates between that, that like that desperation of like, please, someone just date me, please love me to all right yeah. I'm just I guess I'm unlovable right I'm going to be alone right and you know it's like uh I have to get used to the idea of no one's ever going to care for me and it is definitely a fear or an anxiety around attachment and love and these attachment styles are not secure and they come yes. from probably family right which we'll talk about later yes. uh, or previous relationships um Fear-based dating is very black and white. Yes. We're either like in it and like, yes, and this is the person and I found them and like, just put a ring on it. Just say that we're done with this because yeah. the dating world is trash. Instead of like actually taking your time and getting to know the person and then being like, yes. are you even good enough for me? Yes. I used to have a joke in my stand-up that was like, I spend the first six months of a relationship tricking the guy into liking me and then the next six months figuring out if I even like him back. <laughs> And I know I'm not the only one because people would laugh. 
<laughs> it's true, but it happens quite so much. It's a uh, definite trap that people fall into in terms of like just trying to get that affection, get that attention, get that a uh, person to deem them to be worthy enough, mm-hmm. right? And a lot of times it is also very goal-driven and where you are more focused on the prize, um, what you deem to be the prize at the end, mm-hmm. as opposed to the connection uh, that the two of you are building. So you're more focused on, you know, and, and usually a lot of people are very timeline-based. You yes. have to get married by 35, I have to have a child by 35 and a half or, you know, something like that. This, there's like usually a, a timeline or like a goal, a life goal that people are trying to achieve. And so they're willing to skip, you know, or overlook all of the red flags and things like that, as long as there's some sort of buy-in to that goal and they're hearing, you know, they pick and choose kind of what they want to hear and what they want to see um, because they want to stay on on what they deem to be on track to their goals. So they're going to overlook everything else. Right. And if they're going to get into a relationship, it's going to be even harder to get out of it when you realize that you don't like it. I think they like it up to a certain point. Yeah. I just want to be like, hey, like, do you even like him? Because like, if you end up dating, like you're going to have to break up. Yeah. You also had another infographic recently, the signs of unhealthy behaviors in relationships. Oh, yeah. And that one, I was like, I have never seen this just put out so clearly. The first one is invisibility. Yes. So there are people that want to dim their light so that their partner can shine. Mm -hmm. And what that means is they don't want to create any sort of problems or frictions in the relationship. They want to be everything to be perfect. So any problems or any red flags or things that come up in the relationship, they're not going to talk about them. They're going to sweep that under the rug. They shrink themselves. Shrink themselves and shrink what their unmet needs are because they're focused on trying to stabilize the relationships. They don't want any ripples in the water whatsoever. Mm -hmm. They don't want to be deemed as difficult. They don't want conflict in the relationship. And they're willing to walk on eggshells, walk on eggshells, have their needs be unmet for whatever their goals are. Their goals may be to keep the family together because we've got children. Their goals may be, I just want someone in my life because I'm very lonely. And so I don't Mm -hmm. want to be alone. Um, it could be that was any a fear based thing too. It was like, it I just don't want to be alone. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a lot of people that will go through, go to any extremes to prevent being alone. Mm-hmm. There's also, um, avoidance was an unhealthy behavior in relationships, mm-hmm. like s- spending a lot of time away from home or just like avoiding discussing problems. Yep. There's a lot of, you know, self-professed workaholics, people who spend hours upon hours on end at work. And when you do that, that is an avoidance. If it's not survival, like yeah, and when yeah. I say survival, I'm meaning that you have to work like this in order to make ends meet. Otherwise, right. you know, there's going to be some severe consequences. But there's people that their income they make is their own totally schedules. Fine. They have yeah. enough money. Yeah, they yeah, just they, choose to yeah. be at the office. They they choose to live at work, and work becomes their identity, and they never come home. And so, home is a place that they try to avoid at all costs. And why not? Because it looks better. You know, work is celebrated. Right. I'm working, you know, I'm making money. That's very performative and it looks good in certain areas or certain aspects. Right. But you are severely neglecting this whole other life at home. And the people at work think that they're amazing because they're not as toxic with them. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> they always get stuff done, right? They're the most reliable people. They get they get mm-hmm. it done, right? So they're very performative in that way. And so, yeah, so it's avoidance. Work is a way of avoiding dealing with problems, um, a way of dealing with having a family, being married, or just, you know, having a partnership a lot of times. Um, and it's just, you know, it's an easy way out. And it's something that people have been conditioned to think 
that, hey, I know how to do this. Yeah. I know how to work. You know, I'm an expert at that. But I'm good at this. This other stuff. Yeah, I can't do that. This doesn't require any EQ. Yeah. (laughs) Or like space for other people. Yes. Blaming is also an unhealthy behavior in relationships, um, which I was like, yes. Like, and I even, I find myself doing it too in relationships sometimes. (laughs) And then I have to step back and be like, wait, like, you're not behind on stuff because like you were hanging out with this person. You're behind on it because you you have ADHD. (laughs) There's a lot of people that personal responsibility is very challenging for them. Mm -hmm. They don't want to say that I messed up or that I have an issue that I need to work on. I need to, you know, go do what I need to do, be an adult and handle my own issues as opposed to doing that, they would rather blame someone else mm-hmm. for how they reacted or didn't react. Um, and so blaming and finger pointing is very common in relationships. And it's not, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean it's narcissistic or toxic. It's unhealthy. It's, yeah, it's very unhealthy and it doesn't solve the issue. Um, if anything, it drives a wedge between you and your partner um, or right. you and whoever. If there's a problem in the relationship and it's always the other person's problem like that's not very likely yeah and it's not very (laughs) likely that you're ever going to have any personal growth Mm. part of being in a relationship is making mistakes being young and dumb before you're older and wise and learning from them Mm mm-hmm The next one is mind reading, which we're very on board with because we're always like, communicate. Mm. Um, And this is basically expecting your partner to know what your needs are and your wants without telling them ever. Yes. And then getting mad about it when they don't read your mind. Yes. People are very narrative based. You know, when someone does or doesn't do something, we oftentimes create a story in our minds about what's going on and why they did that and how they feel about me because they did that. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's very like you look at something that someone's doing and you think, oh, that person feels a way about me because they did that. Right. And there's this narrative like, oh, because they didn't acknowledge me this way or because they didn't do that this way they must not care about me or or they care about someone else before me and things like that um so there's a lot of mind reading that goes on instead of talking and trying to connect based on what your needs are Mm -hmm. withholding was the next unhealthy behavior yes withholding affection or i guess anything right it is it's withholding Affection, withholding communication, withholding connection. Withholding sex. Sex. You know, there are a lot of people that, you know, may or may not be listening to your show, but out there in the world for sure, that their partners stopped touching them one day or they stopped Mm -hmm. touching their partners and they stopped being affectionate. For women, more, more often than not, Um, when women stop connecting sexually, it's an emotional issue. They feel like there is an emotional breakdown in the relationship. Either we can't talk, we can't work out problems, or we're talking about the same things over and over again, and there's no resolution, uh, or I'm just not happy with where we're at, right? Mm -hmm. And with men, more often than not, it's usually physical and then they develop the emotional connection. So men have to be physical in order to feel connected, right? That helps them feel emotionally more regulated. And I'm not saying that there's not exceptions to that Mm -hmm. or it doesn't work vice versa, but most of the time, that's what we see in terms of that. And so when there's a breakdown or someone's intentionally withholding, like I'm not giving that to you, like it's like a power, like I'm not giving that to you. That means that there's a shutdown somewhere and we're just not working through. We're not working through. We're not talking. We're not solving issues or there is maybe some contempt and resentment in the relationship that you know, this is a sign that we're done. We're just kind of coexisting as sexless, loveless roommates right now. People want affection. Right. People want that acknowledgement. In whether it's trans, cis, when there's mm-hmm. a breakdown in that, 
there is usually a breakdown in the communication and there's a much larger issue when you're withholding something. Totally. Um, so yeah, there's definitely an, a larger emotional component. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then triangulation, recruiting others to back us up and build an alliance against our partner, um, which is the most unhealthy thing ever. And I have experienced before i've done it before um yes. you see it a lot with um parents and children parents will recruit children to build an alliance against their partner yeah so that's kind of what you know the whole their strength in numbers theory that that kind of thing like if if my children align with me i'm stronger and i can build a power differential between the other person and get them to conform and do what i want them to do or you know By people being like will everybody just, else thinks this exactly exactly so get them to kind of fall in line or just sort of bridge the gap if you will, by, you know, having that asymmetrical dynamic. Um, and then it also kind of, again, it's an ego booster. It's an ego booster when people align with you, but it's also something about having other people help you to do your dirty work for you, where they then also become like your mouthpiece mm -hmm. and they're screaming louder than you are. And so it's like, okay, these people are kind of doing all of the things for me. Mm -hmm. I feel like I've also experienced it where somebody will make up a few people backing them up to be like, oh, everybody thought you were crazy last night. Yep. Yep. You know, so people will do that. They will recruit others in to kind of, you know, and that's also part of gaslighting too. Yep. It's like recruiting other people outside of the relationship to kind of reinforce what you're saying um, so that you can deny that other person their experience or their perception of their, of what they mm -hmm. experienced. And so it's definitely a power uh, power play there to try and do that. Yeah. I, this person I go, name them. Who thought I was crazy <laughs> last night? <laughs> like, what did they actually say? And they're like, well, I mean, I mean, yeah. it's just like a general mm -hmm. consensus. It's like, no, you're gaslighting yeah. me and being crazy. Yeah. Yourself. Or not crazy, but you're being unhealthy and rude. Yes. Neglect is another big unhealthy thing. Mm -hmm. Being unavailable uh, for physical or emotional needs. Absolutely. Pretty self-explanatory. You yeah. know, there's people that neglect their relationship. They might disappear. Mm -hmm. They might ghost, be unavailable. They may, you know, they may even still be in the same house or apartment or whatever and not be speaking to their partner. They're not willing to discuss problems. They're not willing to discuss the future of the relationship or, you know, sort of deal with any sort of conflict um, they don't want to talk. They don't care about how you feel, you know, any of that kind of stuff. So that's very unhealthy. Um, and Or they could just be gone where you physically can't reach them and you don't know where they are, um, mm -hmm. you know, and they don't care to explain any of it. Yeah. And then that leads pretty uh, nicely into the silent treatment, just refusing to engage for any period of time with communication mm -hmm. and just being like, bye. Yeah. And the silent treatment is definitely very manipulative and attention seeking. Mm -hmm. So while they say they don't want to talk or they don't want your attention or they don't want you close to them, it is also very much an attention seeking behavior where it's like mm -hmm. you can't avoid this person going on mute for however long. And it's designed and it, it, to... <laughs> it makes mind reading have to be a thing too. Mind reading and crazy making. Because the first thing when someone goes silent, what do you want to do? You probably want to talk even more. You want to scream and get them to talk even more. Right? And that like, why aren't you talking to me? And so you become extra like needy and clingy. And it's like, why can't you talk to me? And so there's this breakdown that makes you almost hypervigilant about wanting to do that most of the time, or, you know, it could just be like hostile in your mm -hmm. own home. Who wants to be walking around with this person that's very hostile, even in their silence? 
Like, mm-hmm. how uncomfortable is that to be in your house where the person that you're supposed to be living with, mm. you're supposed to be loving on each other, and you can't even talk to that person, and they're right there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, very palpable and uncomfortable. It is. Yeah. Um, you host a podcast called A Date with Darkness, which specializes in education and tips on healing from narcissistic abuse in relationships. Mm -hmm. Why did you start this podcast in particular? You know, narcissistic abuse is um, something that kind of kept coming to me and over the course of my career, my education, my my personal life. Mm -hmm. And I started working a lot with people that um, had experienced it. And it wasn't, there wasn't really a name for it or they couldn't understand what it was at the time when I started working with folks. I started working with folks way back in 2008. Um, So, you know, things have definitely exploded exponentially since then. Definitely. You know, there's a lot of things about dating, about relationships, and just about connection with people in general that you expect to learn, you know, when you're being raised as a child Mm -hmm. in a family, but a lot of those nuances aren't necessarily taught to us. So I decided to start the podcast to provide, Mm -hmm. you know, teaching, provide education to uh, normalize experiences. Um, Originally for women is Mm -hmm. what I was gearing towards, um, Mm -hmm. towards women who had experienced narcissistic abuse and just didn't know what it was, what it looked like, and how it showed up. In their families and their romantic relationships? Yep. Correct. And so that was how it originally started, just to provide tips that you just don't learn and that Mm -hmm. no one really talks about or, you know, doesn't really normalize for you. So just to kind of like, you know, learn from me and learn from this so that you don't have those types of experiences as well. And so that's the whole point or the the starting point uh, Mm -hmm. for the podcast. And probably for people to start breaking the cycle too, because I feel like it must be a lot of people coming from their family relationships and then seeking out similar things in romantic ones. Is that? Absolutely. And people don't know what it is. They just, they just say, you know, you know, all people are trash Mm -hmm. or I only seem to attract this type of man or this type of woman. And so they make these generalization statements, not really understanding why these behaviors or these patterns or these types of relationships keeps happening. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, absolutely. What are um, some of the signs of like a narcissistic parent? Um, So signs of narcissistic parenting is parents that don't want their children to express their own individuality. Mm -hmm. Um, So they look at their children as possessions or objects and extensions of themselves so that your child belongs to you and they are an object of which you um, you can do whatever you want to with, um, mm-hmm. but your child is also living your experiences. So they are an extension of you. So you try to micromanage and get them to do life as you would or could or should have. Mm-hmm. Um, and so there's that sort of just really just, um, you know, staying on your child um, and traumatizing them in that way and like berating certain behaviors into them. Parents that are very demeaning um, yeah. and, and um, they devalue their children. Parents that talk badly about their children in front of other people or to other people um, or behind mm. their children's backs. Um, or to other ch- children. Uh, parents, yeah. Right. And Mm -hmm. um, parents who treat children is valuable only when they see their children is bringing something to them. So I call this exploitative. Mm -hmm. So when your child is able to be a source of income for you, when your child has accolades, um, has earned accolades, and then you can brag about that and, and attribute that to your fabulous parenting your child is totally a rock star in school because of me and what I've done even Um, though they've never really even encouraged yes certain endeavors absolutely emotional unavailability so they can't show up for their child emotionally they can't acknowledge their children's feelings um, or their children is an autonomous individual or that their child has needs um, that need to be reciprocated 
um, parents that are extremely manipulative, mm. uh, financially abusive, mm-hmm. physically abusive, sexually abusive, um, emotionally abusive, all of those other things that are an extension, you know, parents that are jealous or in competition oh, yeah. with their children. Yeah, I've recently been seeing a few TikToks. This is where I get all my information now, but um, yeah. not really. But I did see a few TikToks recently. It's like become a trend where it's like parents who are giving their children everything that they didn't have and then like silently screaming about it. And I was like, something about this seems like a little problematic because yeah. how's the kid supposed to react to that eventually? Mm. Yeah. But then I also yeah. like want to be understanding that it's like, okay, these people didn't grow up with certain things that they wanted and yeah. they're doing, they're trying to treat their children better. Mm-hmm. So also maybe it's a good trend. Yeah. You know, TikTok is shining the light on a lot of things. Um, I really enjoy it a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, So, yeah, that's definitely an example of some problematic parenting behaviors there. Yeah. I mean, maybe they're babies now, but it's like if that's the one that makes you go viral and then you happen to be a narcissist as well, you're probably going to leave it up because you want to see those numbers. Yeah. You want to see those numbers and and have that reflect back on you. But, yeah, you know, and I think um, other traits would be like, you know, parents that uh, maybe pit children against each other or siblings I should say against each other yeah Um, so you're treating one child you know the golden child as they say so you're treating one child like they are the favorite they are the most attractive they can do no wrong and the other child is like the scapegoat so they get blamed for all the problems and they get the Mm -hmm. wrath of fury on them all of the time Um, and so that child is always considered to be the problem child or the black sheep um, of the family so yeah that's also you know just sort of creating that drama and creating that um the hierarchy, I should say, yeah. in the in the dynamics. Who can be the best for the parent and make life the easiest? Yeah, and who can compete for my love? Yeah. yeah. It has a, a lot of effect on the children because it's like, who am I if not just being someone to prove I'm worthy of your affection? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, you know, child's identity can, uh, you know, this is where perfectionism comes from people pleasing, Mm. comes from overperforming, comes from when you have a child that's constantly trying to compete uh, or trying to perform to be accepted in the smallest way, trying to earn their parents' love by, you know, reaching these imaginary goalposts that their parents set for them. And I, I say they're imaginary because, you know, There's always going to be something else. Yeah. Yeah. It's like the other thing they they say, you know, we'll only accept you if you get good grades in school, for example. We'll only accept you if you can be this way for us. And once you break your back trying to get to that point, oh, it's still not good enough. So you have to do something else. So it's always moving. And even then, it's not you know, what you're getting isn't the quality. You might get glimmers of good times, which creates the sense of false hope Mm. that perhaps your mother or your father will actually love you as a parent should. And that's a falsehood. It's almost like dangling the carrot in front of the donkey, but it never actually happens. I feel like a narcissist's confidence can't actually be that good. And so their extensions are never going to do enough. Well, you know, that and the narcissist is always thinking about themselves. You know, the when you think about their capacity to love, their love is very, is, is objectifying a person mm. into an object. So it's not going to be the kind of normal, healthy, relational love that typically we're trying to get when we're looking for approval. And yeah. that's why I say it's like dangling that carrot because it's not it's not going to be like we hoped or we imagined or we fantasized what it would mm-hmm. be. And it's conditional. Like I feel like a parent is supposed to unconditionally love you and then narcissism just flips that on its head. It flips, but it's also not love in the sense of, it's love in terms of objectification. 
Mm. Like you belong to me. What can you do for me? Mm -hmm. But when you're talking about the nurturing love, the love that's in spite of the flaws, in spite of everything, it's not that in that same sense of the word. It's very conditional, like you say. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's very like, It's almost very tangential in that way. And like, you know, what can you be or what can you do for me? Yeah. Do you think that narcissists often create more little narcissists or what happens to their children? Any number of things can happen to their children, but it is absolutely possible that, you know, if you have a narcissist and highly likely, right, if you have a narcissistic parent, that you are also going to have, you know, either you're going to be a narcissist. It's a possibility that you can be, or you have a sibling that Mm. uh, grows up to be a narcissist. So it's very possible that, you know, within a family, you have multiple narcissists um, within a family and some of the children could be empaths. And usually the ones that are most empathic are usually the ones that are deemed as the scapegoats. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, And because they're the ones that have to really go through the trials and tribulations of not being accepted. Um, That's not always the case, but most of the time that's what we see. Um, versus, you know, the golden child, the golden child has already does, does very little work to get acceptance. And so they learn skills of entitlement. Um, and so they learn that they can get their way and that they could see how other people can get treated if they're not deemed worthy in another person's eyes. And so they, they learn how power dynamics and differentials work very early on. So mm-hmm. absolutely, I think um, it could be created by a family. A narcissist can be created by family history. It, uh, trauma may have a lot to do with that as well. Mm-hmm. Is there, Mm -hmm. um, are there warning signs you can look for in yourself if you feel like you might be a narcissist? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so warning signs, uh, would be if you feel like you are a narcissist, um, more than likely, if there's a question about whether you're a narcissist, usually people who ask themselves that are not. That's what I've heard. Nine point nine nine ten. Yeah, or, or not because you know narcissists are looking at everyone else as being the problem, not me. Mm. So everyone else has a problem. Um, so, but there are people that do have insights and are willing to admit. But you know, the other things would be like lack of empathy. Are you, do you lack empathy? Um, There are people that know that they are extremely manipulative. They are extremely coercive in getting people to do what they want for them, you Mm -hmm. know? And so a lot of the the ways that they manage um, their life is through secondary gain. What can others do for me? And I'm going to take what I want and I don't care about how it impact, how it impacts anybody else or what sort of effect it has on someone else's feelings. I'm just going to take what I want. And then when I'm done with that relationship, I'm done and I don't care about it. Yeah. Um, you know, viewing themselves as being better than or godlike. Um, so just, you know, I'm more special, I'm more beautiful than everybody else. And, you know, that's, that's how I'm better than everyone else. I don't belong in the same category as everybody else. The rules do not apply to me. So they're very hypocritical, meaning that I can do what I want and not have to suffer the consequences because I Mm -hmm. wanted to do that or what I want is for the taking. Um, But, you know, the rule, but they'll be quick to point out, you know, how someone else isn't following the rules or, you know, they're violating some sort of norms. So those are things that could look at people that um, are very chaotic in the relationships, narcissists do not have, uh, you know, um, stable relationships. Again, mm. their relationships are for their benefit. So what can people do for me, whether that's admiration, whether that's providing something of some sort, some sort of material benefit, like maybe I'm living with someone and I'm not paying rent or yeah. this person is giving me money. Uh, but any type of um 
person that tries to have a romantic relationship or friendship um, and where there's deep feelings involved, not going to happen. So more than likely, they do not have uh, long, stable, nurturing relationships. Rage is also a They could have a long relationship, just not a stable one. <laughs> Correct. Or healthy one. Correct. Right. Um, and so it's if, if they do have one, it's going to be very tumultuous. Uh, but usually most narcissists are like, I don't need friends. I don't yeah. need people that are very close to me. Right. And so, um, yeah, so those would be some of the things, like I was saying, um, you know, rage is another factor. So people that get extremely angry. Mm-hmm and fly off the handle and rage can actually also you know a lot of people think of it as like this violent screaming rage it doesn't always have to be that it can be a silent cutting rage um, filled with a lot of content a lot of resentment um, long periods of silent treatment Um, you know so that too uh, could be a sign Um, people that are abusive yeah yeah and that can that be unlearned? Like if you see that within yourself? It depends on where you're at in the spectrum. Um, unlearned, no. Um, what it can be, you know, if you have people that are, you know, because I believe that narcissism runs on a spectrum. Um, and we all have forms of narcissism. Everybody, um, most people from what we see have healthy forms of narcissism where, you know, if you look in the mirror, you think, oh, wow, I look good today. That's, you know, I'm doing my thing. You know, that's a healthy form of narcissism or self-esteem, if you will. Mm-hmm. Right. And so of people that are on the low end of the spectrum of narcissism, of pathological narcissism, there is a possibility for change um, in what you're talking about in terms of behaviors. And Mm -hmm. that could be learned in terms of um, basically modification of impulse control. A lot of narcissism act, a lot of narcissists act on impulse I want what I want and I'm going to take it and it's mine and I don't care about what the consequences are. And so in working with people that have those type of pathology, pathological behaviors, what you can do is if they're on the lower end of the spectrum, you just teach impulse control. So thinking about your actions and the consequences a little bit more before you act on them. Does it mean that they're going to care how their actions have impacted others? No, mm-hmm. but it does mean that they will maybe think about be things more thoughtful. They act. Yeah, be more yeah. a little bit more thoughtful about what they're doing and how that's going to impact them in the long haul. Yeah, um, you talk about toxicity a lot too. What's the difference between like a toxic person and a narcissist, basically? A narcissist, what we look at, um, you know, and a lot of people kind of blend the two together. Mm -hmm. Um, And a person can be very toxic and not be a narcissist. And a narcissist in today's society is overused. It's not actually referring to someone with narcissistic personality disorder, which is, you know, a diagnostic characterological disorder. Um, And so... With that, they like have said, narcissistic like, tendencies. Yeah, they might have narcissistic tendencies or traits, is what we call them. And so, what that means is that that person is experiencing that person to be uh, to be a certain way with them. So, when when folks usually refer to someone as a narcissist, they're usually referring to someone who's very cold and uncaring, who's, uh, you know, they may have a high conflict with, or that person is abusive towards them, or that person lacks empathy towards them, or that person has um, done something within the relationship that's been extremely manipulative or calculating. But when you talk about a person that's a narcissist, more what they're talking about is a person who's been that way towards them. And there may be another sort of identified cluster of people that they've been that way with, like that have that experience with them, maybe in other romantic relationships versus when you have someone that has the personality disorder, they're that way 
across the board. Mm. That's who they are day, night with everybody. Everyone is going to experience that person. It doesn't matter who you are. You're going to experience that person as being uh, someone who has narcissistic personality disorder. Um, How common is that? Narcissistic personality disorder is very rare. Um, You know, so it's about maybe 1% maximum 3% of the population um, versus someone who's toxic. Again, you're Mm -hmm. talking about someone who you have a direct experience with. And that person doesn't necessarily have to be, doesn't necessarily have to be narcissistic, narcissistic. It could just be when the two of you get together, it's like somebody lit a stick of dynamite and you just combust. The two of you, your Mm -hmm. energies or your vibes aren't meshing well and the two of you just aren't good together because you've developed a dynamic between the two of you that's highly conflictual. Or maybe when you get with this person, you're super codependent, right? Mm. Um, Or you're codependent on each other. Or maybe when the two of you have a fight, you two go, you know, you might go beneath the belt with that Mm. person. Right. And so that's a that's a again, a one on one dynamic usually in that you're developing. Um, You can have toxic families and where the family can be dysfunctional as a unit. So you Mm. might go home for the holidays and your family is dysfunctional as a unit. However, when you're you know, your brother, your sister, your mother, your father go to work. People describe that person as like the most wonderful person to work with. Yeah. Like, yeah. Who is that person? Right. And you've experienced them a totally different way. So behind closed doors with you, that Mm -hmm. person, uh, the relationship is very dysfunctional Mm -hmm. and, you know, the world experiences them another way. So do you think that there are toxic people? I think there are people that can be very toxic Um, and they can still be good people, too. Um, Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is, I'll use myself as an example. Uh, You know, it wasn't that long ago that I used to work for corrections, right? Mm -hmm. And in corrections, um, it's a very toxic environment. It's very much that environment. It has that crabs in a bucket mentality. Mm -hmm. So you have people that are trying to reach leadership you have people that kind of come in and they, they're talking about uh, other people behind their backs. And then, you know, people may be doing something. So they report them to their manager or there's just this like this uh, dog eat dog mentality. Mm. And so when you're in an environment like that, it's very easy for you to then become a very toxic person. Right. It's very easy Mm -hmm. for you to have that negative energy where you're like contributing, where you're like gossiping about people or you're like hoping for someone else's demise. Right. And that demise doesn't have to be like, you know, anything extreme, but you kind of want to see them get in trouble at work or you just don't like that person. And it just has this negative energy. And even though you might go home every day, where does that negative energy with you go? It goes right along home with you. Mm -hmm. Right. It goes and then it comes back to work with you the next day and it goes home again. And then you go home for the weekend or whatever days you're off and it's still there with you. Mm -hmm. And so that then becomes an identity that you have to work to get rid of that. So, yes, I very much believe that people can be toxic. Yeah. Or if it's you're grown up in a toxic household where gossiping and shitting on other people in your house. Yeah is how you bond with people, then that's how you're going to go out into the world. Absolutely. And so when you get into another environment that's very similar to that, guess what? That all comes back, right? That all comes back and then it's magnified because now you're in this big cluster of people that also do it too, right? And it's celebrated and it becomes once again, very normalized. So absolutely. Mm Mm-hmm. How early do people pick up toxic behaviors around them, like in families or? With families, it's usually a little bit more difficult um, Mm -hmm. because families, um, you know, 
whether we like it or not, your parents or your caregivers are going to be your role models. Whoever raises you, that's that's who you typically look up to to pick up from. You know, pick up norms, pick up social cues, um, how to interact in relationships. You look to your parents for that, and so a lot of times. Even if kids go to school and they see other parents interact with their children in one way and they may say, you know, to themselves, my parents don't interact that way. Even still with that, they may have some inkling that something is wrong, but they still Mm. normalize what their experiences are at home. It's usually not until they leave home or something extreme happens, something extreme where they're removed from their parents' care or they have to be emancipated or something like that, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, that they recognize that "Mm, there's something wrong. My my family's extremely dysfunctional or unhealthy um, that, that that happens. And they may have, you know, there are kids that do have insight. There are kids that are also in counseling that may be given that insight from, you know, that counselor or therapist. So there's always exception to the rules. But, you know, when I'm working with my clients, a lot of them look to TV, you know, for their social cues. So they they look to TV and then they look to their parents and they try to try to match or try to align it as much as they can. So, for example, a large uh, group of people that I work with are African-American women. And, you know, in my age, I'm 42, you know, a lot of women from my era or a little bit older always idolized the Cosby family, Mm. you know, so they look to see how much like the Cosby family is my family. And if you know the Cosby family, they're not real. Right. They're not real. That's not like that doesn't exist in real life. Mm -hmm. And so there's like a total mismatch from what they see on TV. And it's like, I, I wish my family could be like that versus having to look up to who your parents actually are. Yeah, that family is very not that. Not at all. So in these toxic households or households with parents that have narcissistic traits, um, usually those children will go on to have toxic relationships themselves, right? Absolutely. So how does that manifest? Oh, it manifests from very early on because, again, you have to think that children have been conditioned to learn that love only happens a specific type of way. Yeah. Right? And even though they know that it's hurtful and abusive, it's what they know. Like, it's what they've experienced and what they know. And so you could see that very early on from teenage friendships Uh, to romantic relationships and very early on because um, whether we like it or not, that's like a skill that they've taken in. Um, Mm -hmm. And so more likely than not, um, children who have experienced abuse will have uh, an abusive relationship later on in life. Mm -hmm. And whether it's a higher likelihood. The person being like exhibiting those traits as well or seeking out people that are similar. Like I feel like if you have a narcissistic parent, you might, and you're like used to molding yourself to them, then you might try to mold yourself to somebody else because you think that they won't like you if you are just as you are. Absolutely. Um, So yeah, just molding yourself. um, But also, you know, just um, what tends to happen with people who have a history of uh, being raised in a home with a narcissistic parent is there is a fantasy that develops, right? The fantasy that develops is that I always want to try as much as I can to have a loving relationship with a parent, with my parents. I want to try to have some semblance of love and, re- and try to gain acceptance for who I am. And it usually takes a long time for that fantasy to shut down if it ever does, because sometimes it never does. However, 
that fantasy is very strong and they it continues to run that same script over and over again in a lot of relationships that they recreate. Like, I want someone to love me. It's very mm-hmm. fear-based um, attachment, fear-based dating, fear-based friendship. Like, I want that love and I just, I will do anything to get it. Um, and so mm-hmm. there's, um, you know, there's a susceptibility to abuse because I, you know, they kind of want to do that. And so it's, um, it's kind of like that age old saying, like, you know, opposites attract. So you hear you might have someone that's very cold and emotionally unavailable, which is very similar to that parent that raised you. Mm-hmm. Well, perhaps through this cold and uncaring person, you can change the narrative. And yeah. so maybe, maybe, I think I can change that person, whereas I didn't have success before. And finally, Mm -hmm. I can have some sort of successful relationship and I could be deemed worthy through the eyes of this person. Yeah. Uh, We're done technically. Can you stay longer? (laughs) Yeah. Oh, cool. Yay. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Um, So if you are suspecting that you're in a toxic relationship or if you're in a relationship with a narcissist or something like that, what are steps that you can take to get out? I think the first step that you can take to get out is actually saying that there's something wrong here, Mm -hmm. right? Taking that personal accountability and just trying to zoom out as much as you can and say, you know, really looking at the situation that there's something wrong here You know, we're not getting along. My needs aren't being met. Something's not right here. So I think that's the first step that you can take, Um, you know, and then maybe browsing your local Barnes and Nobles and Amazon or whatever to try to get a handle on what's going on through books or free resources. So you can kind of look at what your... um, stuff is that you feel like you're dealing with. So if you feel like it's emotional abuse, if you feel like it's high conflict, just do a quick Google search and there's going to be a thousand things that come up for that, right? Listening to this podcast. I also always, yeah, that's what my next thing is going to be. I always encourage people to talk to a therapist um, that can also help you to really start to look at what's going on here. Um, and what's what the issue is, because a therapist can be objective. They can point out when your partner may be disturbed or have a disturbance of some kind or when you may have a disturbance of some kind mm-hmm. um, and really just objectively help you lay it out. Safety plan, if that's something that you need to do in order to get out of a relationship, uh, but more more than not, help you to name your emotions, help you to talk about what's really going on and develop some actionable steps and be very supportive. And then, to, you know, point you in a number of other um, directions for resources, whether that be a support group, whether that be a particular podcast or, you know, whatever mm-hmm. the case may be, so they can sort of pinpoint what specific things they think would be helpful for you. Um, you know, and so just, just doing that. Um, I would also say the other big thing mm-hmm. is um, connecting with your support system. A lot of times when people are in toxic mm-hmm. relationships or, or relationships with the narcissist, they isolate or because they've put all of their energy or their efforts into that relationship. So maybe reconnecting with people that were emotionally supportive or finding new areas to emotionally support people that are um, outside uh, of the relationship and they're not necessarily connected to that partner or person that you're in that toxic relationship with. So they're not going to have that bias or have that pull to want to tell everything that you're telling to them, to that other person. Um, Examining the facts, you know, a lot of times when we are in these relationships, especially when we're getting out, um, that person may be continuing to swirl around and convince us of something and tell us 
you know, tell us all the sweet nothings that they, that we want to hear. But we need to go back and look at the facts of what was actually happening in that in that relationship. So if okay. you have a person that's like, you know, your ex is trying to come back into your life and they're making all these empty promises of I promise that I can do this or I can do that. Look at the facts of the relationship. Look at the facts of who this person actually was and what, what they, they actually did to do. You. Yeah. Let's not get get our heads stuck in the clouds, so to speak, and get back into that wishful thinking. Because wishful thinking based on empty promises is very easy to fall into. But we want to stick to the facts and maybe write that down on paper so you can see it in black and white. Um, mm-hmm. That's going to be a defensive ally. Joining um, support groups of other people who have experienced that and social media is your friend in this area because there are a lot of, you know, even just like on Facebook, like you're going to join an emotionally abusive or family estrangement or, you know, narcissistic partner, you know, uh, group where other like minded individuals have experienced the same challenges um, and that can be supportive to you and that you could learn from them also. Are there some statements yeah. or phrasings that can be used when you're arguing with a toxic partner? I think that's, you know, if you're fighting with someone, I think that's going to be different based off of everybody's situations because some people are in some highly abusive situations. So I would say with the caveat, um, you could say, like, I'm not going to engage with you right now mm-hmm. or your behavior is inappropriate. I can't talk to you when you're like this. Mm-hmm. Or it's not okay uh, for us to talk um, like this. Or I can see that you're getting upset. Maybe we can table this discussion for now. Yeah. And that could be a way that you could talk, you know, try to diffuse the conflict in the moment, um, so to speak. Um, so I think that's the best way to do it um, is to just yeah. diffuse the conflict in the moment. Yeah, I think those are pretty good stoppers. They would be like, oh, Mm -hmm. like even if they are the most enraged, those are things they think you can really like hear when they're being said. Potentially, there are some people that once they get to a certain point, they don't hear anything. And that's why I say everything is, you know, with a caveat. And of course, Mm -hmm. if this situation escalates and becomes dangerous or violent, I always encourage to call 911. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, also seek assistance at your local domestic violence shelter. Um, National Domestic Violence Hotline is Mm 24-7. And they can link you up with resources either in your area or even better in another state. Um, So if you need to get away. Mm -hmm. So if you suspect that you're in an abusive relationship, the first step do you think would be therapy or... I think, well, there's a lot of people that even if they're in domestic violence relationships are very hesitant about going to a shelter, right? Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people that say, you know, my situation isn't that bad that I need to go to a shelter, you know, and there's a lot of minimizing of what that bad is. They just don't, they're not ready to leave their home uh, most of the time. So with that being said, I, you know, calling the domestic violence hotline is free is 24 mm-hmm. seven and it's right away. So, you know, I, I would, ins- I would say that you can call them anytime morning or night and get to speak to a counselor. So you can always do that. Whereas counseling, you know, you gotta, you gotta call around and, and do that. So, you know, if you're in a domestic violence situation, I always encourage people to do Mm -hmm. that. Um, You can also connect with your local uh, county or um, social services um, and see what what sort of services that they have for that also. But definitely, um, I encourage using the hotline, which is Mm -hmm. 24-7. What can parents in toxic relationships do to better help their children? They can stop being in denial. Um, There's a lot of parents that say, you know, I'm going to I'm going to stick this out uh, for the better good of my my child. Yeah. So that I can uh, so my children can have a mother or that my children can have a father. Um, Well, you're doing more harm than good that way because your children are learning from you 
yeah. uh, in that other person, how parents treat each other or how mm. abuse works. So they're learning to, they're observing that, right? Whether we want them to or not, they're going to pick that up. Um, and, the, and so they're learning about how to be in relationships with other men or women or, you know, whomever uh, their parents are. So they're learning about that. Um, so stop being in denial about what this is. You're not ready to go because you feel uncomfortable with the change, right? Um, so take personal responsibility and making sure that you put yourself as well as your children first. And part of that, that's not necessarily meaning that you have to stay with the partner. So sometimes that may be, you know, you might want to stay in that dysfunctional relationship because of the financial discomforts, right? That's fear-based, right? Um, fear-based, right? It is very fear-based. Um, but also, you know, you've might feel like you're going to be alone, right? right? So being honest with yourself about what your reasons are, because at a certain point, children become of age, you know, and what are they going to think and what are they going to see? You know, my parents put another person's needs ahead of mine. Um, they weren't necessarily worried about my safety or worried about what what I took from that relationship or how that relationship impacted us, right? So what you do, your actions definitely have a trickle down effect. Um, you can always, I always encourage parents to talk to their children, you know, and talking to their children isn't negatively about the other person. It's just like being real with your kids. Like this behavior is not okay. And this is not something that I want you to do. So let me be an example for you and how to be an appropriate adult in this situation, mm -hmm. right? And let me just show you how to navigate these things as best as I can. That's ideal. I'm, I'm not saying that that's always possible. You know, every situation is different. But I do also think that educating and talking to your children is also very important. Yeah, um, I just want to get back to fear-based dating for a second. We date like this clearly because of how we've been raised and stuff or relationships mm -hmm. that we've already had. Um, how can somebody work on themselves and change their ways when it comes to dating? Um, and then how can you be there more for a partner with the tendency for fear-based dating? Um, that's a good question. I think, you know, in terms of how can we deal with that or, or manage our own stuff, we have to get to the core of what our issues are, mm -hmm. right? Um, and the core of the, our issues is usually uncovered in therapy, right? But we have to be honest with ourselves and say, we have some issues here. I'm driven. My behavior is being driven by my anxiety, my feelings of anxiety, my fears that I cannot seem to uh, get a hold on. So I need to, one, find out where these fears are coming from to see how these fears keep showing up in my life in three develop a solid intervention for those fears right so i just mm -hmm. i need to like do what i need to do and knock it out right because these things are showing up and they're causing me to stay in relationships and where i have this knee jerk reaction where i just like lose my stuff every five minutes if my partner doesn't do what I want them to do or need them to be or yeah. need them to show up for me. And I think as a partner, you can support what a person, you can support what your partner is going through, acknowledge their fear, but also support them on getting assistance. But also being mindful of how that person's behavior show up for you. So if I'm a healthy, well-adjusted person, and I have this person that's overly fearful, overly mm -hmm. just clingy, jealous, anxious. toxic. That's that that's yeah, anxious. That is definitely going to have an impact on me, you know, and that not necessarily in a positive way. So being mindful of how that impacts you and making sure that you're standing firm on your boundaries on whether or not this is something that you also can um 
sustain or maintain with this person or that you energetically you feel like is healthy and appropriate for you because there is a certain level of anxiety that also can sometimes just become too toxic for other people to deal with. So just being mindful about where you're at and how you can manage this also and if it is something that's manageable for you. Mm -hmm. And, you know, being real about whether or not um, this person's values are in alignment with yours. If their values aren't in alignment with yours, but you're just kind of feeling bad and trying to save face so that this person doesn't lose it and get super scared, you're not being honest with yourself. So just me, just being as honest with yourself and with the other person as possible about that. Mm hmm. Um, and then those unhealthy behaviors that we talked about, how can you work on those once you notice them? The unhealthy behaviors as far as um, in the relationships, you mean like the, the silent treatment and all avoidance. of that? Yeah, yeah. I, again, I would definitely encourage therapy for that. Therapy. Um, notice. Yeah, I definitely am a Always. big proponent for that. Always, um, you know, there's at this point, I feel like there's no reason not to, um, you know, because you just want to be the best version of yourself that you can be. But, you know, again, realizing like just take again, taking personal responsibility about how you show up, how you impact your relationships, getting feedback from other people in terms of how other people experience you. Do yeah. other people experience you this way? And if you're getting like, if if people are saying, if there's like a general consensus that you are, let's say that difficult. you can be mean. Yeah, yeah, you can be mean. You can be difficult. You need to look at that. If you have yeah. people that are genuinely in your corner and that care about you, that the general consensus is like you could be mean or you could hurt their feelings. That is something that mm -hmm. you need to maybe take a step back and really start to reflect on that and see what's going on. Why get the feedback? Like, why do you say that? What is it? What are the things that sort of add to that? Really just take it in and not judge what they say, but make it a mission of yours to work on it because. Yeah. You know, at the end of the day, if you feel like you are inherently a good person, you deserve a better life for yourself. You deserve to feel a lot more connected with people. And life is very short. So just mm -hmm. try to do what you can to get a handle on it um, so that you can get love that you want and you're not repeating the cycle of maybe what you were exposed to early on or, you know, relationships that your relationships aren't looking the same. Mm -hmm. And those unhealthy relationships, too, can stem from what you grew up with. If you yes. saw somebody giving the silent treatment as like a, a form of punishment instead of communicating you're yes likely to do that in your relationship yes you are very likely but you know there is a higher likelihood but you know your trauma is not an excuse to treat other people poorly totally totally i was and gonna people say have too, to remember that <laughs> yeah no i was gonna say when you were like if if a bunch of people that are close to you say that you have like a mean streak or something, we used yeah. to have a, um, a saying in improv when I did improv back in the day that it was like, if there's a scene and everybody's having fun and you're not having fun, you're the asshole. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like if you think the world yeah. sucks, like maybe it's you who's doing the sucking sometimes. Absolutely. It could, it could very well be. And it might be some external factors, you know, like you might have, you know, some serious depression. You could have yeah. some anxiety. You could have yep. PTSD. You could have a whole number of things. But if that's the case, make sure you get your work treatment it. for it. Yeah. yeah, work on it. Do what you need to do, whether that's medication and therapy, whether that's whatever it is you need to do, you know, get a handle on it so that you can live life in a better way. Yeah, because it's going to be better for the other people around you too, but it's also going to be better for you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, and all of these, I think, lead to um, 
unfulfilled sex lives, obviously, if you can't communicate yes. with somebody, if you're afraid of communicating with somebody um, yes. about basic issues, you're not going to be able to ask for what you want in the bedroom. If you're with Absolutely. a narcissist, they probably aren't trying so hard with you unless they yes. see it as a reflection upon their yes. great work. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Um, so yeah, all of these issues just seem like they are very damaging and mm. that therapy probably would be good for the narcissists themselves, but even better for the people who are experiencing them and sure. want to break the cycle. Absolutely. Is there a way to trick a narcissist into therapy? <laughs> Um, not trick per se, um, but there are people who get mandated to therapy, you know, for legal reasons, they get themselves into trouble. There mm -hmm. are people who make therapy conditional as a way of staying in the relationship. You know, if, if you can't go to therapy, then I won't be, you know, in the relationship with you. So there's people that sort of give that ultimatum. Um, but even then, you know, it's like, they may or may not attend, but again, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to be open and forthcoming or willing to change. So if there's no um, motivation to change behavior, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not going to be as mm -hmm. beneficial. The motivation totally. to change has to be there. Totally. So give them some motivation and fucking leave. Yeah. Um, <laughs> this has been um, very eye-opening, very important. And I'm so happy sure. that we got to talk about this subject matter. You have a sure. lot more on abuse. Um, so I encourage everybody to listen to your podcast. Can you tell everyone where they yeah. can find you online and the podcast? And Yeah, you can go to my website, drnataliejones.com. You can go to instagram.com backslash uh, Jones. I think it's Dr. Period Natalie Jones. Um, yeah, and so you can find me there. But my website is probably the easiest place to go. It's got all my links there for, you know, every sort of social media platform mm -hmm. that you can find me on, you know, on the podcast at datewithdarkness.com, or it's also on the website as well. And she does individual and group membership coaching. So if yes. anybody needs someone. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Of course. Um, I have to ask you this question, which I have to ask everybody after a sexual experience, which this has been a little sexual, I guess. Um, Dr. Natalie Jones, did you finish? Yes. Amazing. Thank you so much for coming. <laughs> Thank you. And also, if anybody has questions for you, would you be open to coming back for some additional sure. Q&A? Awesome. Absolutely. Yeah. Cool. Uh, thank you so much again, and we'll see the rest of you next time on How Come. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. It's not you, it's me. I try so hard to finish honestly. They say you'll know when you go all the way from A right down to O. Oh, no. I think that I still got a ways to go. Oh, oh. I'm sick of this and I have got to know How come? How come? How come I can't achieve? How come I can't achieve? I'm rolling up my sleeves I'm rolling up my sleeves Oh baby I believe these guests can help Cause I can't do it by myself I wanna just